song right now. So we're Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Keith Collar. I'm the Associate Dean for Strategic Partnerships, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Harvard Graduate School of Education for the Zantz Initiative Innovation Challenge, part of the Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative. We really appreciate your taking the time to join us today, both here on campus and through the live stream. So welcome to all of you watching. Um, we'll hope that you'll stay connected to the leading work of the Zantz Initiative. I'd like to start by having you all give a round of applause to our finalists who are all sitting right over here. As
As you all know, we're at an important moment for early education, and now is the time for creativity and collaboration so that all children can have high-quality experiences and positive long-term outcomes. The tremendous response to the Innovation Challenge is a tribute to so many early educators who want to apply their expertise and their experience to scalable and sustainable solutions. The Innovation Challenge was initiated to catalyze, accelerate, and advance new programs, products, and services that bear on the lives of young children and the adults who educate and care for them. In this second year of the Innovation Challenge, we received 160 applications, which brings our two-year total to over 360 applications. And I can say that we've been truly humbled and inspired by the creativity, the dedication, and the mission-driven vision of all of the applicants. So this is a very special event for us to host. We want to thank everyone who applied. We want to wish you all well with your ventures. So today's event, as well as the entire Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative, has been made possible by a gift from the Saul Zantz Charitable Trust. We're deeply grateful to the trustees, and we thank them for their generous support, their vision for innovation in early education, and their inspiring commitment to better opportunities for all young children. So please join me in giving them a big round of applause. In addition to the Innovation Challenge, the Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative includes a groundbreaking research project, the Zantz Professional Learning Academy, and Masters and Doctoral Fellowships. The Zantz Initiative is unique in the approach to each of the elements, but also in how the three components complement, reinforce, and advance one another. So we invite you to speak to members of the Zantz Initiative team who are here today, learn more about the whole initiative, and, you know, for us, it's an exciting opportunity for our school to make an important difference in the lives of young children. I'd like to recognize the faculty co-directors of the Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative, Noni Lasso and Stephanie Jones. <laughs> Noni and Stephanie are extraordinary leaders, accomplished scholars, and skilled teachers. They contribute so much to the research, teaching, and entrepreneurial spirit of the ed school community. Their leadership of this initiative reflects their commitment to rigorous research, evidence-based practice, and purposeful innovation, for which our school is both grateful and fortunate. So again, please join me in thanking Noni and Stephanie for their leadership. <laughs> also, I'd like to extend a welcome to Samantha Agner Trewargi, the Massachusetts Commission of Early Education and Care. We're glad that she's taken the time to join us. We're glad to have with us today the group that is part of our Language, Behavior, and the Brain program. So welcome to all of you. And we welcome those winners and finalists from our 2018 Innovation Challenge who were able to join us and continue to do good work. And we thank them for all that they do and for being part of the Zantz Initiative community. So the Innovation Challenge is organized into three tracks. The idea track for new concepts that are emerging, a pilot track for ventures with new products and initial funding, and a scale track for projects poised to expand their impact. I can say that we received outstanding applications in all three tracks, and all of you who are here as finalists have accomplished a lot to be with us today. So again, congratulations. So here's the plan for today. Um, all of the finalists in a track will present. Three minutes for their formal presentation and three minutes for uh, questions from the judges. And we're gonna transition as quickly as we can from pre one presentation to the next. At the end of the presentation for each of the tracks, we'll collect the judges' scores. We'll also ask the audience to rank the proposals, and we'll put up the instructions at the end of the track. We're going to have about a 10-minute break during which we'll tabulate the scores, and at that point, we'll announce the winners. So we're very fortunate today to have five outstanding judges who bring deep experience, impressive success, and valuable perspective on impactful innovation in early education. Charles E. Carter, the Senior Evidence Director of Project Evident. Lynette M. Fraga, Executive Director of Child Care Aware of America. Eni Ekebogwu, an Education Initiative Analyst at Omidyar Network. Lisa Vanderpool, Vice President at Inkhouse. And Rick Weisport, who's the Senior Lecturer here at the Ed School and Director of the Making Caring Common Project here. So we appreciate that all of you are contributing your time to our Innovation Challenge, so please give them a round of applause.
I want to thank Emily Wickland Hayhurst for all of her excellent work. The finalists have worked with her closely over the past several weeks in all of her organizing and planning for today's event. Uh, many thanks to everybody who's here from the Zantz Initiative team. Uh, Megan Bach, who's on point for tabulating all the judges' scores. Robin Kane, who's helped us with all the coordination. Our media and tech team, who's coordinating the presentations and the live stream. And Lizzie Baird, who has the important assignment of being our timekeeper for today. And she's one of our Zantz fellows. So, Lizzie, thank you. So, you know, what you'll see today are finalists who present a number of different strategies for impact in early education. What you'll see across all of the projects are the innovative approaches to high priority challenges in the field, the hard work that's brought them to this point in their respective trajectories, and the potential to make a positive difference in the lives of large numbers of young children. And with each of them, you're going to see the optimism of their entrepreneurial spirit and their exciting vision for better outcomes for young children and enhanced ways to support the adults who educate and care for them. So thank you for being with us. We're so glad you're here. Um, we're going to get started with the idea track. So please join me in welcoming the team from Flourish and Fraser Forest in Georgia, represented by Susie Riddick and Tanya Holder. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Every child learning in a forest. At Fraser Center, that's our vision. Every child, both with disability and without, regardless of income. Preschool forests have existed in Europe since the 1950s, but today in the United States, fewer than 100 exist, and the vast majority of those serve white, middle class, typically developing children. At Fraser Center, we have a different vision. We are uniquely positioned to create accessible forest-based learning for early education providers. We have over 70 years experience providing education to children with disabilities. Today, we are an innovative inclusion early education center, and we just happen to sit on 39 acres of old growth forest. This year, we are creating forest-based curriculum that will integrate seamlessly into our classroom curriculum. Next year, we're going to provide that curriculum to Fraser students. But more importantly, we're going to provide our forest-based curriculum and access to Fraser Forest to other early education providers in Metro Atlanta, especially those serving low-income children. Our goal is that 500 low-income children in Metro Atlanta will have the opportunity to experience forest learning in Fraser Forest. Inquiry-based learning, coping with toxic stressors and creative problem solving. This is what exposure to green space does. Research is confirming that exposure to green space creates structural changes in a child's developing brain overcoming these challenges so that our children and teachers can learn and flourish in the forest that's right outside our front door expands the learning world for a child exponentially. This green space is transformed into a learning environment that will offer a redefinition of the child-teacher relationship. It also provides increased opportunity for learning through movement, which promotes gross motor development. It will also broaden the traditional classroom activities from within the four walls of a classroom to a, limited, unli a limitless resource. From exploring all the wildlife that makes the forest their home to creating, a, creating an abacus with acorns. The Fraser Center is already leading the way in our community with the early education program that includes children with differing abilities learning side by side. Adding the forest-based curriculum would further position Fraser Center as an experienced leader with other early education providers by providing access to the forest as well as the forest curriculum to early learning centers in our community, giving providers, giving priority to centers that serve low-income families. Help us allow all children to gather and learn in the Fraser Forest and flourish for a lifetime.
Thank you. Thank you so much um, for sharing. So my question is, um, what do you believe is the most unique parts of the curriculum that you're trying to um, replicate? And how do you plan on supporting the educators that are actually going to be implementing the curriculum? <laughs> There's a lot in that question. Yeah, there is. Why don't you speak to how sure. we're going to support the teachers? So one way, um, the teachers will be involved from the beginning. The cur curriculum has not been created yet, and we're going to allow them the opportunity to help create the cur curriculum specifically for the Fraser Forest. Uh, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to ask, what do you see as your biggest challenge in getting this idea off the ground, and do you have any costs uh, associated with this? Do you know kind of what your plan is? We do know, have a plan. Uh, the, the biggest hurdles uh, to, I think, force preschools taking off in the U.S. have been regulations and cost. So we're trying to overcome both of those. Um, we will incur a cost to bring force-based curriculum experts here to work with our teachers to create the curriculum. Uh, but we exist on this Fraser Forest. We're the caretaker of it. it. We maintain it as a public park. It's free to everyone. So knowing that uh, low-income families in Metro Atlanta and over 60% of students in public schools in Georgia are on free and reduced lunch, we knew that we had to try to get this model out. The forest we're going to offer for free. We're going to offer the forest curriculum and bring the centers we have a relationship with that serve low-income families to Fraser Forest. We'll train them with our curriculum and then give it to them. They can have it free. Basically, they got to put gas in the bus and get to Fraser Forest, and the rest is done. Judges, you're all set. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susie. So our next team from SmartShift, Early Learning Centralized Float Pool Application, Indiana, Maureen Weber and Brittany Creer. Good luck. As a nonprofit operator of nine early learning centers and a frequent partner of other early learning providers throughout Indiana, we know that maintaining a qualified workforce is the single most important driver of learning outcomes for the children that we serve. We also know that it's the single biggest hurdle that many providers face. Yeah, my um, given the challenging market fundamentals, Early Learning Indiana is pursuing a multi-pronged strategy to really reimagine every aspect of our workforce, from recruiting new pools of candidates to expediting their preparation uh, for our classrooms to deepening their practice to ensure that we extend their time in their careers. While we focus on these longer-term action plans, we can't un underestimate the realities that we face in this moment. Our industry has both a systemic teacher shortage and daily exigencies that stretch providers to the limits of safe practice and leave families scrambling for emergency care. We propose to address the daily workforce demands uh, to enable providers to invest their time to focus on improving instructional practice rather than simply struggling to meet ratio requirements. SmartShift is a first-to-market digital staffing app that aims to build short-term and part-time workforce capacity while offering unusual suspects the chance to enter the ECE field. Inspired by successful models in other industries like Airbnb, uh, Uber, Instacart, SmartShift crowdsources workforce supply to offer providers a centralized resource pool that can be accessed on demand. To be eligible to use SmartShift, providers must be registered in their state's quality rating system and under high-quality status. To get started, they'll simply create an account, input profile and payment information, and be ready to start posting shifts. The system or the app will maintain a historical record of all previously posted shifts so that providers can stay connected to preferred shifters over time. On the shifter side, to be active in the network, users must pass or routine background checks and medical screenings, sustain adequate ratings, and be current in all required trainings. During account creation, individuals will indicate preferences and availability so that open shifts can be marketed to them via push notifications and other features. Other app highlights include two-way rating systems, dynamic pricing, and personalized nurture tracks. 
We estimate a budget of $750,000 to develop, market, and pilot the app in Indiana. We'll market to college students, stay-at-home parents, recent retirees, and others seeking part-time work. Through the pilot, we'll target 40% of center-based providers using at a rate of five shifts per month and 10% of family child care cohorts using at a rate of one shift per month. With a projected 18,000 shifts per year, we expect to recover the original investment within three years. Additionally, we'll use the data collected through the app to fine-tune marketing efforts and identify key personas likely to be attracted to the ECE field. Thank you. So my question is about the compensation. And so we're, you eloquently stated in your pitch about the um, challenges with compensation as it relates to early childhood mm -hmm. educators. What are you thinking about doing in order to make this kind of position something exciting for potential early childhood educators to go into, given that challenge? You know, I think our hope is that we can make it so easy for um, unusual suspects to come to the field that they will be attracted uh, to get to know the early learning workforce and to have an opportunity to do something different. So um, our compensation will be competitive with uh, other providers in our area, and we will charge a nominal fee to support the matchmaking. We've also talked about dynamic pricing so that critical short-term shifts that need to be filled could be priced at a different rate um, to kind of help offset and attract new individuals to the market. Um, I have a couple of questions, both related to the nature of the shift work. Um, one, how are you thinking about engagement between the workers and providers? Um, thinking about the context of um, curriculum, child tendencies, et cetera. And then how are you thinking about how parents will react to shift workers um, from a safety and trust perspective? And this is really intended to be a, an emergency kind of situation. We know that many providers use substitute um, a workforce uh, already. We know within our own nine early learning cen centers that we operate, we average about 13 substitutes per week. And so this is really just a way to make that connection easier. And we can wrap around supports of additional training to ensure that those individuals who are um, coming into center environments or other care environments are as well trained as they can be, given the short-term nature of their work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So please welcome from Maryland, 2Gen Includes Men, supporting Baltimore City children and their fathers through the power of play. Presenting Patricia Hoagie. started 20 years ago when we moved the Children's Museum from a location outside of the city into Baltimore's historic fish market building located in the heart of the city. We're uniquely situated now in the middle of East and West Baltimore, and we're just steps away from the children, the families, and the communities that we serve. While we are a physical place with exhibits and programming, we are and should be much more than that. We currently are on a reimagining journey to ensure that we're also a valued community resource that we're an educational laboratory, and that we're a change agent. And we've been having deep, thoughtful, and intentional conversations about what this looks like. So we've been asking ourselves, how are we serving the community of Baltimore, particularly our youngest learners and the most vulnerable? How are we innovating to solve problems and their needs? And are we having an impact, and are we making a difference? As a result of these discussions, we have embraced a two-gen approach and believe that the best approach is one that creates opportunities for and addresses the needs of both children and the adults in their lives. This is particularly true in Baltimore City. Our city is a city in need, and we're finding that our youngest learners are the ones who are most affected. They are not demonstrating proficiency on their state assessments relative to the students across the state. They are not demonstrating kindergarten and school readiness commensurate with statewide performance. They are experiencing two or more adverse childhood experiences, and they are not experiencing the power of play. As we peel back this onion even more, we find that the effects of poverty and unemployment, father absence, and family disintegration are also major contributors to the problem. So we see all of this as a call to action 
because research tells us about the importance of play to children's overall development, that parents are children's first teachers, and that engaged fathers make a difference. Baltimore Center for Urban Families has been working deep in our community for 20 years to change the trajectory of men's lives. Our plan is to partner with their Responsible Fatherhood Project and bring cohorts of vulnerable fathers and their children together at Port Discovery Children's Museum to access and learn about the importance of play. This will include monthly family events with guided play activities, free play opportunities, lunch and learn activities where we discuss types of play, the types of play they engaged in that day, and take home play kits that extend this play into the homes and the lives of children. Families will also receive a one-year membership to the museum and ongoing communication and support from us. And Port Discovery staff will receive professional development to add on the topic of adverse childhood experiences and cultural competency. We've worked to identify impact goals for both the children and the families, the fathers, as well as evidence indicators to help us evaluate our progress to know we're making progress towards our goal. This evidence will guide our future work and hope to scale our initiatives. Thank you for recognizing the importance of this work and this issue for our city and for imagining with us the potential this exciting idea could have. Hi, thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. As a father, I really love this idea. Um, I'm curious to know, are the fathers who are targeted, are they the primary caretaker or not? And if they're not, are there... Um, other supports to keep the connection going, even though they're not living with the child uh, at 9 o'clock? And most often they're not, and they're not always engaged you know, with the family. So that was one of the initiatives. So one of the things that the Center for Urban Families has found is that they bring cohorts of fathers together, and they bring 20 or 30 fathers together, and then they move on you know, to the next cohort. Last year they had targeted 300 fathers and they had 316 in the program. So they're targeting another 300 this year. So we wanna work along with that. But we were just meeting with Joe Jones just last week. He was telling us that the best um, outcomes are when those fathers stay with them for three to five years. So that they keep engaged, that they need coaches, they need mentors, they need activities. So again, we felt like this was such a great fit for us to like, how do we become a part of that ongoing relationship and support the fathers and the children. That's great. One, one other quick one. Will you be tracking them over that three to five years as well, just the year that they're a member of the museum? That's the goal, is to work with these 300 this year, but because we know there were 316 that just finished last year, we want them to roll in too. So there were hundreds before this. This, this is their fifth year of the program. So they have four years of these fathers that have been engaged. And so what we'd like to do is to keep them engaged. And then really what the, when we look at the impact goals is to say what happens not just in one event, but what happens over time. And so that we start to see changes in behaviors in the father and in the children, and the families. Thank you. Hi, thank you. This is, thank you. This is great. I'm excited about Good, it too. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, one question I think follows on this question, is this focused on fathers or on men? And I say that because of the, the huge numbers of kids who are not growing up with their biological father, but are growing up with some other significant man in their life. Yes. And I'm a new granddad, so even granddads. <laughs> I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, and just to laugh about that, I'm a grandmother, too. And so my husband laughs because, like, kids push him away, like, to get to me. So, <laughs> so he's fighting for time. <laughs> so... On that, when we're working with the Center for Urban Families, they are focused on fathers and responsible fatherhood. So what we needed was a trusted partner um, in the community because that was one of our challenges. The question before, what was the, one of the challenges? We need somebody who's already in the community who has a trusted relationship. So that Responsible Fatherhood project had four goals. Two of them were economic, as far as stability for the fathers, but the other was to increase their parenting skills and to improve their relationships with the families. So we felt like that was a perfect fit for us. And we really wanted proof of concept, so then we could start to grow it, and so that it's not just at the center, that it's other places in Baltimore. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenters uh, are Jasmine Spencer and Ashanti Jones, Strong Families, Mighty Southward Loyalty Program from New Jersey. Good afternoon, Harvard. 
The South Ward is a culturally vibrant neighborhood in Newark, New Jersey that the families we serve call home. Today, we'll be outlining our plan to engage families in the zero to five space to maximize their child's fullest potential. We'd like to set the stage by introducing you to Michelle and Kevin, a typical South Ward family in Newark. Michelle Thomas is a 16-year-old sophomore in high school who's pregnant. This shifts her focus from prom dresses and college choices to how many extra shifts she'd have to work in order to afford a week's worth of formula. Already the product of a single parent home in a low income neighborhood, Michelle is already aware that she'll have to work full time in order to support her baby Kevin. And she pursues a second job. Michelle isn't unlike many parents in the South Ward who are fighting an uphill battle to provide just enough to get by. And Kevin, he's only one of 400 babies born in the South Ward every year under the same conditions of poverty, undereducation, and underemployment resulting from years of historic inequities. And children born in poverty are 54% more likely to be underprepared for elementary school and 40% more likely to de develop a learning disorder. And parents like Michelle, they do their best to move forward, but they need the additional support to lessen the effects of poverty. So, over the last 10 years, the Southward Children's Alliance has created an ecosystem of support beginning in the prenatal stage and spanning the full academic career of their children. By limiting their exposure to adverse childhood experiences, we believe support begins at home where new mothers like Michelle are paired with a nurse and a coach and are dedicated to ensuring that the baby successfully enters into kindergarten. In addition to one-on-one -on -one coaching, we offer a robust Road to Kindergarten series of programming that primes children for academic success. Because they're trying to ensure their survival, many families, like Michelle, don't have the privilege to access our full scope of services. So to combat low program participation, we've decided to create the Strong Families Mighty South Ward Loyalty Program. So who here gets excited when they earn their stars at Starbucks or get air miles from their favorite airline? <laughs> so we actually aim to recreate that same excitement for our families. Um, the rewards platform will incentivize our parents to engage in the services that we offer that can move their families forward. Families can earn their strong points uh, by participating in the programming that's offered by SWCA. Uh, programs such as financial literacy, family college, which is zero to three, um, and parents as teachers will allow families to earn the points. Families can track and redeem their points in a mobile app, which will offer rewards that support their daily needs. We plan to utilize a user-friendly platform that will make event awareness, earning, and redeeming points for rewards a seamless experience. So when incentivized to participate in our programming, families like Michelle and Kevin will gain valuable resources and put their children in a better position to succeed. Our goal of the loyalty program is to facilitate academic success of 125 newborn children every year. Thank you. I love this idea, it's great. Um, I would like to hear a few more specifics about the loyalty program. How are you gonna let parents know that this is in existence? And again, uh, same question I asked last time, do you know how much uh, capital you're gonna need to kind of get it off the ground? So, um, so we are aiming, our family college program is something that is already developed, is already in um, existence, as well as the road to kindergarten pipeline. So parents who were actually recruiting to go into family college, a condition of their graduation, or what kind of like more of a reward for their graduation is entrance into this program that will kind of facilitate their continuing along that road to kindergarten. Um, and in terms of capital, um, it will cost for the platform alone, um, it'll be $1,200 for the year. Um, and because it integrates with a system we're already used, which is Salesforce, um, most of the cost will go towards um, our incentives. We're not exactly sure what those are, so we can't give a, you know, a ballpark figure of um, how much that would cost. Thank you. Um, can you shed a little bit more light on the partnership side? Um, what types of partnerships are you thinking about? How those um, look like um, in reality? So we are a part of the Southport Promise neighborhood. Um, we have 20 partners currently um, who are offering uh, workshops and services to our families, and they are oftentimes underutilized. And so in order to incentivize more participation, that's why we came up with the Strong Families Mighty Southward um, loyalty program. And those partnerships span from cradle to career.
great. Oh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so our final presenter for the idea track, uh, Lauren Berman from New York, Toyland, a library for play. I am so excited to introduce you to my innovative idea in early education, Toyland, a library for play. Toyland would be a community-based library of playthings to support play and the positive development of children. Children could belong to Toyland like they do their local public library, visit to borrow toys, and connect and play with other children. It would be a beacon in the community that endorses play for its overall positive impact on child development. As a library for play, Toyland would operate with donated toys. Toys would be cataloged and organized so that the collection could be tracked. The operation would be nonprofit, and this innovation grant could be the spark that makes this idea reality. Toyland would be an institution that provides space and materials for children to play. Lending toys would provide children with a model for equity and access, environmental sustainability, and underscore their belonging in a community. Toyland would increase children's engagement with play and its impact could be measured. A pilot Toyland library would be created while simultaneously creating systems and manuals for a network of Toyland libraries that could be developed. There is outcry from education professionals that early childhood classrooms need more child-directed activity and a building amount of evidence that the opportunity cost of screen-based activity is impacting development. Despite this, communities don't have a local institution that supports play. There is a void. This innovation grant would begin to build the pilot Toyland. Growth would come from establishing a nonprofit and additional funding. There are real structural impediments to play. Standards-based curriculum, screen-based technology, and after-school adult-directed programming. Having Toyland in a community would emphasize the importance of importance and need for children to play, just as a traditional local library supports the overall importance of literacy. The American Academy of Pediatrics released a clinical report in 2018, The Power of Play, that is the most recent broad-reaching research indicating that play is a singular opportunity that provides the overall development de in children, including cognitive, social, and emotional development. In it, they encourage pediatricians to create prescriptions for play. We have been advocating for play within our given institutions for too long with too little progress. A new institution is needed. Why not a library for play? It's been an honor for you to listen and to consider my idea for Toyland. Thank you. My five-year-olds think this is a really good idea. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You Two questions. Um, so you mentioned measuring impact. Yes. Uh, I would love to hear more about how you would do that. Sure. And then I know it's, early, it's an idea, it's early days, but just right. wanted to see if you had any thoughts on what the location would be. Or sure, sure. Um, well, I think the measurement could be um, done by um, the, the children and families that enroll. Um, tracking their frequency, tracking which type of toys go out to be lent, um, tracking um, how long people stay and enjoy the space while they're there, and then seeing um, how, how that increases over time. If we continue to get the same children and families, if the community grows, um, and in terms of location, um, the initial thought is for this to be community-based, and I know my own community best, um, and as a pilot, I think that would work ideally. Um, I come from a small place in New York called Hastings-on-Hudson, which is 20 miles north from Midtown Manhattan. It's on the border of Yonkers. Um, so uh, the, the people that live in Hastings, it's 8,000 people, but a quarter of them are under the age of 18, um, and uh, that reaches the Yonkers area, which has uh, 25,000 students in their public school system. So I think um, the location where it would work best is um, where I am right now as a pilot, but then could grow to other locations. Um, thank, thank you. This is a really interesting idea. Let me see if I can sneak in two questions <laughs> before you keep um, One is, uh, it's, it's what will make the toys compelling. And, and by what I mean by that is, you know, 
Some kids will have devices yeah. at home. These are used toys. Um, right. In my, you know, we've done book drives, and kids don't want use tend not to want used books. They want new books. Right. So one one question to make them compelling. The other question is, you know, not in my my view, not all play is equal, and not all toys are equal. Right. There are some toys and some forms of play that develop social cognitive right. capacities, and. So I wondered how you're, you're thinking about identifying those forms of play, those types of toys, yes. that kind of facilitation. Well, I, I come at this um, as a former educator and teacher, um, as a former preschool director. Um, I'm presently the vice president of the Board of Education in the town where I am. And I, I, know, I know the family culture and the students um, and, and how children play. I have two small children myself. Um, one is 10 and one is four. And I understand completely what you mean by different types of toys stimulating different types of play. And particularly in my years as a kindergarten teacher, um, I would notice certain types of block building or work at tables would bring children together more, develop more language, develop more negotiation. Um, so designing a space, I think, is really key to getting children to want to play with different toys and be lent different toys. Um, I think it's a similar to a library environment. It's, it's, the it's the locus of the experience of being able to say, oh, who's here with me today? Who can I play with while I look around? Um, and I think that would, I know the idea of a, of a used toy is not necessarily, you would think, as enticing to a kid, but yet kids borrow library books all the time. Um, it's, it's the coming together, it's the being in a location together that I think is missing, and I think communities are really missing an institution that reinforces this idea, particularly as schools and as families um, really uh, aren't seeing, um, they're, they're, they aren't used to seeing their children play. So that concludes the idea track. Can we have a big round of applause for the idea presenters? <laughs> you all did a terrific job. Now you get to watch everyone else. All right, so um, for the audience, up on the screen you will see the way to access the poll everywhere so that you can vote. Um, it will ask you to rank the pitches that you just watched. We're going to collect the scores from the judges. We will be back here in about 10 minutes to announce the winners of the idea track and to kick off the pilot track. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Yes, Joe. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that what we're asking everybody to do is think about the um, the research base of the idea, the viability, the prospects for getting traction given that this is the idea track. So these are again by definition emerging concepts. So we want them to, uh, we understand they're just kind of getting started. Um, and you know, based on what you heard, ultimately the idea that they'll have uh, good outcomes for both the children and the adults who are working with them. That, that helpful? Good. Thank you so much. We'll see you in about 10 minutes. You guys will notice a timer on screen, and we're accepting votes until the timer runs out. So just pay attention to that.
Welcome back, everybody. Thank you to our judges for their quick tabulation. Thanks to Megan for making sense out of all of it. Um, these are our winners for the idea track. Uh, we'll ask you all to stay. We're going to take some pictures at the end of all of the tracks. Uh, we had a tie for third place between Flourish and Fraser Forest and Smart Shift Early Learning Centralized Float Pool Application. So, congratulations. <laughs> Second place was 2Gen Includes Men. <laughs> and first place in the idea track, Strong Families, Mighty <laughs> South Ward Loyalty Program. <laughs> Congratulations. Well done by everyone. We're so thrilled that you're here, so thank you. All right, so we have some good energy to kick off the pilot track. Uh, our first presenter from California, uh, the quick check, Sheetal Singh. Thank you, and congratulations. Okay. So how many of you have ever been on stage before to give a presentation, a performance? Okay, so you could sympathize with the story. I'm a musician. I recently had a record release show, which meant it was all new songs, material, and I practiced for months, and in my rehearsal studio, it was sounding really good. So the big night comes. I get to the club. I don't get a sound check. My stage monitors were all kind of wonky. I couldn't hear my vocals. I couldn't see because of the lights except for this guys standing in the front row looking really bored and you know it threw me all of my practice went out the window and my performance tanked you could say that there was an implementation gap in what happened in my rehearsal studio and what actually happened on stage I'm going to talk to you about a teacher PD implementation gap this is Maria Maria is a pre-k teacher at a school district in San Jose. She's a great teacher. She has a master's degree in education. She gets coaching. She's part of a professional learning community. Yet, even with all of these supports, Maria tells me that she can only retain and use about 10% of what she learns in her PD sessions. Maria isn't alone. Throughout the country, despite our best efforts and good intentions, our PD courses, whether they're online or in-person workshops, only really go about halfway. So Maria's district asked us to come in to help implement a new social emotional learning curriculum. And as we were designing the PD around it, we thought, how might we do things differently? How might we close this implementation gap and provide the regular ongoing support that teachers need to really build their practice? Our answer was the quick check. QuickCheck is an online skill building tool that extends and reinforces teacher PD. We call it a digital coach in your back pocket. The tool takes PD content and it breaks it down into manageable strategies. The teacher is asked to pick a strategy to really focus on and master and the tool suggests practices the teacher can use in the classroom based on that strategy. 
After a week, the tool will prompt the teacher via survey and asks the teacher to reflect on how those practices went and what the effect was on her kids. The data is fed back so that she can track her growth over time. And what we really get is a self-directed journey to fluency and practice. The Quick Check was co-designed with teachers, and it really borrows from behavioral science in terms of goal setting, self-reflection, and the power of nudges and reminders. We piloted the Quick Check over two years. The teachers loved it, and in our evaluation, teachers using the tool scored higher than teachers on their um, assessments, the teachers who were not using the tool. With your investment, we could further develop the tool, we could build our library of curricula, and we could bring this tool to more teachers and students, and together we can close the teacher PD implementation gap. Thank you. We all want to ask questions. Um, so love the focus on self-reflection and the knowledge and skill development um, and growth mindset. Um, wondered if you could speak a little bit to two questions. Um, how does the digital coach and the coach in your back pocket mm -hmm. that, align with in-person coaching? Um, and also with the, as you think about scaling and, and piloting this, how does the curriculum um, that the teacher utilizes, how is that aligned with how the, co the teacher is getting information? So the intention of the tool is that it aligns with the curriculum that the district is using or the teacher is using with their coach. So we did this in a particular district around one curriculum. It was called the Pyramid Model for Social Emotional Learning. But the tool is essentially an empty vessel. It could be used with any curriculum. And it should integrate with coaching programs. Um, so. But there were teachers who were not receiving coaching. Everything was opt-in in the district we worked in um, who were also using the tool. So it could be used with coaching or without. It could extend and reinforce. It can replace. Uh, another district we were working in decreased funding for coaches. And so they're really interested in using the Quick Check to supplement. Hi, thank you. Um, I love the practicality of the tool. Um, I have a question, is there an objective component to um, not only the teacher applying what she learned, but that that's actually having an impact on the child. So the beauty of um, working with other curricula, like pre-existing <laughs> curricula, is that we can leverage the built-in assessments. So um, this pyramid curricula had a teacher observation tool built in, and so we measured the effectiveness of the tool via those assessments that were already happening. And, and, well, and then there is the teacher's opinion too, right? It's teacher self-report, and it's her own data, or his, and um, part of that really builds a self-efficacy because, you know, teachers don't like to be judged, you know? <laughs> There's a lot of accountability fear that goes on, but if the teacher can just see for herself, and we tell them, we're not gonna share your data with anyone. This is just for you to track your own journey, and um, that really makes a difference to teachers they can see that they're doing a great job. Thank you. I think okay. I heard a timer. <laughs> right. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. So please welcome from Massachusetts, uh, Susan McDonald, creating a deliberately developmental school culture. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. I'm really excited to share this project that is designed to look at improving quality from the lens of creating a growth culture for the adult learning community. What we know is, and we've seen today, there are many, many initiatives out there to support the increase in quality in early childhood education. What leaders are struggling with is their ability to support the professional growth and development of their teachers to implement these strategies that keep coming up. Many, many models. I've been researching this, doing some work on my own with this project, and I came across this amazing book in Everyone Culture. 
And I knew from the moment I read the first chapter that this was a concept we needed to bring into the field of early childhood to support the adult learning community. We are experts at being deliberately developmental with children. It's time we create a shift in these strategies to become more deliberately developmental with our teaching staff. I started a small pilot project in Boston using a range of eight programs um, from very different corporate, nonprofit, profit based programs, and Karen was one of our participants in the study. She came to us after having her staff completed an in house survey that showed that they were not feeling supported by her and they were very unhappy about the lack of professional opportunities and they felt this lack of professional growth was impacting the care of children. This was something that was shared in different ways from all of the participants but Karen was crystal clear on this. The first part of the pilot project was to focus on being deliberately developmental by having data from a well-researched tool, the Growth Culture Indicator, which is a 28-question online tool that provides data in these three key areas, edge, home, and groove. Karen received an extensive data report that showed the gap between how she was currently supporting her teachers and how they desired to be supported. In all three categories, the gap existed. Karen was able to create a new vision empower her own energy to focus more on teacher development to support this energy. The impact of this work for Karen and all of the participants was increased clarity, increased focus, being able to have the strategies and tools they needed through the coaching work that was part of the project and the four intensive leadership retreats. My hope is that this work will become a national model, that we can bridge the gap between how we're currently supporting teachers and what we know is essential to establish a growth culture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, the pilot project did you glean any lessons that you'll apply to, to the ongoing project from the pilot? Um, that was the first question. And then also, um, just do you have a plan in place for how to become a national model? Do you have a business plan or a growth plan? Our, our growth plan is actually we need a larger scale pilot. So we have really great data. We did data at the beginning of the six month period. They had four leadership retreats, they had two individual coaching sessions, and then we did follow-up data. And we want to replicate that. We had um, eight programs, about 600 staff doing the survey. So we have some really interesting data points about the level of trust, the level of respect, the leader vulnerability that needs to happen with this. But we want to take it to the next level, refine the survey, refine the components of the leadership series so that we can then work on the scale up. But for right now, we want to get to the next pilot level, and I work very closely with the Away to Grow team to gather this data for the teams. Every program had a 20-page data report on, eight, on each of the 28 questions. So they were just you know, eyes wide open in terms of where they could go. Hi, thank you. And Lisa, you took my question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Other quick question, uh, from the pilot, uh, did you determine the coaching was enough? Um, was, that a, was that enough time in the coaching to help them think about how to change? And Because they had the four intensive leadership retreats that functioned as a PLC, we had a lot of interaction. And then they could work through their individual issues on how they were going to structure the changes in their program with the individual coaching. Is it ever enough? You know, it's a tough question. But for this model, people really appreciated that break out of having the one-on-one -on -one time. Thank you. Um, could you speak a little bit to how large the cohorts were? Was there any impact in terms of the number of people that have participated in the retreats and how you were bringing that together? It was a one cohort model. So we had eight programs, everything from early Head Start, large corporate centers, after school multi-site programs, private individually owned programs. So we tried to cover a range of the models that were out there, but we had these eight leaders and all of their staff. 
And you know, one program could have had 120 staff, one program might have had 10 staff. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenters from Say Kid, Minnesota, Delon Crosby and Scott Chanky. brought props. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Delon. And I'm Scott. And we're with SayKid. SayKid has developed a screenless, play-based learning platform in the form of a plush robot. Now, before I share with you what it does, I have a question. How many of you have seen a young child in front of a screen? Raise your hand. All right. Now, keep your hand up really high if you think it's a great idea that the average kid is spending two and a half hours per day in front of a screen. Exactly. Screen time affects almost everything that's important for child development. But this is not about screen time. It's about how do we help kids set, up them, set themselves up to be successful. Because right now there's a few things getting in the way of that. First, why are so many young kids in front of screens? Really, education often is cost prohibitive for a lot of families. So there's no practical way to reach millions of kids where they're at, which is in their home, without a screen. Second, we know that a lot of the most important skills, things like social skills, language, are all developed through back and forth interaction and by modeling behavior, which is hard to scale. Finally, we know that technology has to play a role, but you just showed me that technology is often exacerbating the problem. So the reality is that most technology is not designed for early learners. If you think about it, this interface, this rigid interface, isn't really designed to promote tangible or imaginative play. Kids don't develop social skills or language skills by touching buttons, and visual content often overstimulates rather than engaging kids. So the reality is, is the most powerful technology, the internet, the computer, isn't really practical during the most important period of development. And we believe if we can solve this paradox, we'll change early education. So Stay Kid is proposing a screenless, play-based platform that helps kids learn in a safe, natural, and engaged way. The way it works is kids actually play the role of teacher. They teach the, both the robot and each other through group play. And all of our interactive experiences line to the number one standard in the US. Look, we did not uh, seek to just create a talking robot. Um, we actually have eight uh, development items um, in designing our intervention. Um, in, additional, in addition to imaginative play um, and agency, Oops. we also focus on uh, group play um, and we have group-based interactions that help to foster relationships between other kids. Additionally, uh, we align our interactions uh, to the teaching strategies uh, curriculum, but we also try to emphasize modeling behavior in conversational terms. Finally, you know, you can't move the needle in education without being cost effective, and we've designed an intervention that uh, uses modular parts and in, inexpensive in, in software. Awesome. So here's a quote by Kylie Burke, uh, who not only grew the largest early childhood curriculum and assessment company, but she actually developed the curriculum. So she's someone to really admire. Ultimately, SayKid wants to be the most engaging early learning technology company on the planet. And for us, this means three things. How do we help kids, or how do we reach kids that are hardest to reach? How do we help them build skills that are really difficult to teach? And how do we replace screen time with speech? Thank you. Um, thank, thank you. This is all, this is all very, very promising. I'm, I'm having some trouble, though, trying to figure out exactly what it is. And what I mean by that is, like, what does this robot do, and what is it? <laughs> I'm about to get a demonstration. We're doing a lot of them. All right, so let's try it. So there's all kinds of things that can go on, but we'll try it. Echo, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm the world's first screenless, play-based learning platform. What does that mean? It means that I help kids learn in a safe, natural, and engaging way. Can you give an example? Kids learn best by teaching, and since robots don't have skills like empathy or creativity, kids get to teach me. That's incredible. What do we need people to do? Vote for Say Kid. All right. <laughs> so, that's just something we made, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we could go through a variety of different experiences, and kids basically teach the robot 
whatever the sort of, if it's cognitive or social emotional, whatever the thing we're focused on. And um, yeah, and we try to promote group play where possible and relationships. Okay. Thank you for the demonstration. Um, I can see that the, the robot is very adaptive to the context, um, but you guys mentioned um, trying to reach those that are most vulnerable. Um, and when you think about that population, it ranges in terms of language, in terms of culture, ages. So how does the experience with the robot um, adapt to, to the context of the child? This is what gets us so excited because it's so adaptable. Uh, so because it's software, it scales. And so we can adapt languages, uh, accents by age. Uh, younger we go, the more group play. So we don't have to process every uh, utterance or a word. We can work with parts of words. Um, so it's just um, honestly like we're surprised at what's possible. And so. <laughs> and we even take a focus uh, in our testing to um, test on different accents um, d for uh, the interactions. So. Just real quick, um, you know, reaching the most vulnerable populations, is this something that's going to be in the classroom or that families are going to have to afford? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, uh, it's designed to be inexpensive. So we can make it for less than a tank of gas. Uh, and we're thinking by starting smaller, so we really want to perfect it. So we're working with early childhood chains right now, one of the largest in the country. But ultimately, we need to reach consumers. But it's really expensive to reach consumers. And so that's why we're working with some of these partners. And we hope to ultimately reach consumers in the future. And you have five-year-olds, so you should buy. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our next presenters from West Virginia, Telepractice Services for Communication Disorders at West Liberty University, Stephanie Bradley and Tori Gilbert. Good evening and thank you so much for having us here today. We wanted to be able to give you that opportunity to learn a little bit about what we want to present. Um, our initiative today is to be able to provide a solution to a major problem within our state of West Virginia. Um, and by offering a telepractice suite at our university setting, that would be able to allow us to provide speech and language services to an underserved population. Currently in the state of West Virginia, we have about 50,000 children who um, are diagnosed with some type of disability. Of those 50,000 children, we have roughly around 21,000 children who are in need of speech and language services. But the main problem is, is that we have 76 vacancies in, um, 76 vacancies in our school, speech therapy population. And because of that, we need to um, look at something, maybe another option to help us with those vacancies. So how we can understand the problem a little bit, out of the three of these, the one that hits home most is that of our children with communication disorders, it's not only that it's affecting them academically, but it's also affecting them socially to be able to build relationships. It's affecting them emotionally in that sense. It affects them um, vocationally to be able to even formulate mathematical skills, literacy skills, and different things like that. Um, also cognitive aspects. And because of that, it's really affecting their quality of life. So really our goal with a telepractice suite at West Liberty University, we want to reduce that gap. We want to improve children's access to education and we want to pro provide the best therapy possible that we can, that we can provide. Our tar target population, our school-age kiddos. <laughs> so we were wondering, you know, when we were coming up with this, why, why start with us? Why West Virginia? And the fact of the matter is we have a very low socioeconomic status within our state. And along with that, we have a really crazy high number of children that are being born with neonatal alcohol or alcohol and neonatal abstinence syndrome and NW or NOWS rather. And this number is rising. And so it's actually doubled within the amount of three years. 
And just to show you that visual, that bottom blue line is the national average, whereas our West Virginia numbers are continuing to rise. And we know from research that the studies show that any child that is born with NAS or NOWS has a higher propensity to be, um, you know, language disordered, speech language pathologists are going to have to work with these children. Um, and there's just generally a higher um, average of these children needing our services. So really our vision in all of this is to be able to provide those services and bridge that gap. Um, and to be able to serve um, uh, a population that is limited with SLPs and their caseloads. So our vision, what I want you to do is everyone, please close your eyes right now. Go ahead and close them. Close them for me. We want you to envision right now um, the idea where s children love education. They love to learn. We want you to envision where they want to communicate because they can. We want you to envision um, their ability to develop personal relationships that are positive with their peers. And we want you to um, envision the fact that they're able to do all of those things they're able to learn without any fear or barriers. So please help us bridge that communication gap um, by being able to give our children successful therapy um, and help them be an essential part of our society one day. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that. So I have a, a, two questions. So my first question is in regards to the technology that you're using. So have you already seen success in um, this sort of distal intervention? Um, and if you could speak to that. And also you gave us statistics about the impact of um, some of these conditions that you described um, early in early years, and your age is focused on school age. So I was just curious about what your um, thinking is in terms of intervention at school age versus earlier, in the earlier years. Sure. Um, so telepractice is research-based. It's been about 10 years in the works, and we've seen a lot of positive outcomes from teletherapy, um, whether it's evaluations for any type of disability within our scope of practice or with therapy. Um, and then to speak to why not earlier, um, children within the state of West Virginia go through West Virginia birth to three, from age zero, right when they're born, up to the age of three. After the age of three, there they are either, you know, just not having services or they're going to be receiving services once the school system picks them up. Um, and so some children aren't receiving services at all right now because we just have a lack of SLPs. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry if I didn't get this. It might have been the last slide, but my eyes were closed for the, for the oh. exercise. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's related to the last question. I was wondering... Um, I, I know very little about teletherapy and yes. teletreatment and sort of what it looks like. And if you could take us through one example of a kid with a challenge of some kind and what the evaluation and treatment might look like. Absolutely. Can we take it? Yeah, okay. Um, so with telepractice, it would be, you know, any child who has access to a computer with a web-based camera and then us on the other side of that. So with that, we would be providing therapy just like we would in person where we're asking them questions. We can play with them, um, read them books through an Elmo projector um, or show them different activities that we're doing. We can even do group therapy with multiple kids next to them and facilitate a conversation or have play within the environment. Is there another question? I just, very quickly, <laughs> yeah. I guess what does outreach look like? How do people find out about it and how do they get enrolled or whatever? They, you know? Well, so right now with the lack of SLPs in our state, um, a lot of those children, they are not being served. So um, for us to just kind of get the word out there, the, the, the state of West Virginia, they are aware of the universities within the state. So if we would be able to have funding to be able to market um, and be able to get the word out there, I don't know if right. there's anything else you would add. Right. Also, we have contracts within our state with, with school schools. systems. And mm -hmm. WVDE, which is West Virginia Department of Education, is on board with our universities mm -hmm. in helping to close the gap. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Our final presenters for the pilot track, Abby Crawford and Crystal Cauley, Building the Muscle, Arts Integration, Professional Learning for Early Educators from Missouri. Thank you. I'm Abby Crawford, Director of Education at the Center of Creative Arts. And I'm Crystal Cauley, Principal of Julia Goldstein Early Childhood Education Center. And for this pilot, we've joined forces to build teacher muscle and arts integration. So what is arts integration and why do we want to build that muscle? Arts integration is a constructivist approach to teaching where non-arts content and arts content are held as equals. Children learn through art. And research tells us that learners that engage in arts integration develop deeper understanding and build more lasting neural pathways on which future learning is built. We know that arts integration works across grade levels, but we see our greatest opportunity to study the work and learn about supporting teachers in the early childhood setting. So what does arts integration look like in practice? At Julia Goldstein, a COCA teaching artist works with a classroom teacher to integrate arts into literacy. She shows them strategies for accessing story through movement, resulting in a published work written and designed by three to five year olds. Yet we walked away unclear about the level to which we'd set up the classroom teacher to implement arts integration without the teaching artist. All of our partnerships rely heavily on teaching artist time and they do not currently set up classroom teachers to implement arts integration on their own. We know that classroom teachers can implement arts integration. Where we need to grow is in building the muscle. Our pilot will figure out what it takes to build arts integration skill and will in classroom teachers. Currently, teaching artists serve the classrooms directly. Our pilot, I'm sorry, at Julia Goldstein, this means 63 hours year over year. It yields results. They're all really desirable but it's not sustainable. Our, our pilot will focus on gradual release. Leveraging the trust we've built through our partnerships, classroom teachers will be set up to implement arts integration on their own. This is not a mere focus on the number of hours, but how we spend that time. So we currently co-teach with classroom teachers for about seven hours a year. And with your investment today, we would be able to increase that to 20 hours with each classroom teacher this year. And that's not just co-teaching. We would be engaging in gradual release. So that would be modeling, workshopping, real-time coaching, debriefing with those teachers, and following up. Our theory is that the pilot will set us up to shift intensity with partners over time. And the success of the pilot would mean, again, all of these outcomes, plus a growing force of teachers disrupting the status quo through arts integration, COCA shifting from direct service to consultancy, and therefore increased access to arts integration for more students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome very much. <laughs> um, I have a question related to shifting the behaviors of the teachers. Mm -hmm. It seems that this gradual release uh, model, um, you'll need some sort of mindset or behavior shift, not only from teachers, but also administration. So how, how are you thinking about ensuring buy-in? Yeah. At all levels. That's a great question. So what we know, we've been working as partners for nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing the work of arts integration for more than a decade. And what we know is that teachers are incredibly invested. But I think we've heard today across the board, professional development is an area that needs a lot of support. Right. And so for us, it's not about the investment that's there. It's about supporting teachers in the fluency of the practice and really internalizing arts integration as something that they can do that is their teaching versus an ancillary strategy that they're employing. Right. Um, and so that's where the gradual release comes in and that specific piece of the debriefing and follow up so that even after those 20 hours, there's differentiated follow-up for folks based on what they're needing and what we're observing in the classroom. And we know that some of the greatest challenges for teachers is time. So yes. the COCA artists have been very great at coming in and aligning their work with the work that we do. Right. We try. Yes. Thank you. Um, just building on Annie's question and what you just said, um, and I think this is an ambitious and awesome plan, what do you think, what are the biggest barriers to, to scaling this and getting teachers to do this? Yeah, so one of the things is money, which is why we're here, um, not to be awkward, but 
one of the, that is, that's truly it, right? Teaching right now, the relationship and pattern we're in is very solid, but it's also very stagnant. And so our goal with this pilot would be to really to use this trust that we have as partners and truly study what does this look like for us to be able to do gradual release with teachers here in our other early childhood partnerships in the future, in our K through 12 partnerships after that. So we'll be back here next year for the scaling <laughs> proposal situation, right? But the first step is piloting this to make sure our, our hunch is right and really investing in the teaching artists, making sure that the classroom teachers are compensated for time that they're spending outside of the school day. It's really about human capital. And for me as building leader, it's about me making sure that the teachers don't see this as another add-on, yep. that it can be embedded into the work that they're already doing. Yes, so important. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's give a big round of applause to everybody in the pilot track. Great job. Thank you all. Okay, so now we will ask you all to cast your votes in the pilot track. Um, with thanks to Joe for the prompt in the first round. Um, I think in this round we're looking for the innovation of the projects. Um, you're judging their ability to move from their prototypes into a pilot phase, the research base behind them, their early results, and of course, their prospects for impact. So keep that in mind as you're voting. Um, the poll is open for, I think, two and a half minutes. That's right, Megan's giving me the thumbs up, so it's two and a half minutes, so vote quickly. Um, we will be back in about 10 minutes to announce the winners and to start the scaling track. So thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. I am very pleased to announce the winners of the pilot track. Again, we will ask everybody back at the close of this next session for pictures. In third place, Telepractice Services for Communication at West Liberty University. Second place, Building the Muscle, Arts Integration. And first place, the quick check. So congratulations and thanks to all of you. Great job. Um, and we will now move to the scaling truck. So our first presenter uh, from California, Mona Malin, the Healthy Apple Program. All right, we're just going to jump right in given our time. So the problem that we're trying to solve here is that childhood obesity has reached epidemic levels in our country with profound impacts on children's physical and emotional health. We know that Children who are obese tend to become adults with obesity, and that has many, grab this, uh, <laughs> impacts on long-term health outcomes. We also have seen that one in three children is headed for these poor outcomes without some sort of intervention. We believe that early childhood is a critical time for intervention. It's when children are developing their habits that will last a lifetime. It's also early childhood Providers play a critical role in the lives of families and children, and many children spend 50 or more hours a week in care. We believe that child care providers are in a unique position to change this trajectory. Five years ago, we brought together a range of community stakeholders who all had a vested interest in trying to solve this problem. We, took, we had a goal to build a program that would really serve the needs of the community, and we brought the community in. We adapted a nationally recognized tool we built supports around that would really change practices, and we evaluated the program to make sure it works, and it does. We've been supporting ECE programs in San Francisco ever since. And this year, our goal is to expand our reach and deepen our impact by creating a new mentorship and peer coaching component of the Healthy Apple program called the Healthy Apple Community Champions. We're using aspects of the well-researched Promotora model working with high-achieving, healthy Apple participants and educators with a deep knowledge and commitment to their communities. They come to us with motivation to support their peers and the kids in care. We give them training on content and coaching techniques. They play a role of educator and mentor, kind of walking people through our process and program, which is helping their peers to assess their practices related to nutrition and physical activity, set goals, <coughs> come up with an action plan, utilize resources, professional development, and really implement new strategies, change their behavior, change their practices. We think Healthy Apple is unique. It really combines a lot of public and private resources to reach early educators. We leverage technology to maximize our impact. Our program is built around a technology platform. We're pairing that with community champions, those with our existing online tools and resources to create an evidence-based program that can be affordably replicated. We've seen it grow incredibly in San Francisco. We've been in San Francisco for five years. Sonoma County is taking it on this year. Other counties have expressed an interest, and we hope to go beyond that. As a result of Healthy Apple and Community Champions, we see children eating healthier foods, engaged in more regular physical activity, developing the habits that we hope will last a lifetime. And we feel like with minor investment in the early years, we believe that we can change the trajectory for these children and save billions on future health costs in the process. Hi. Um, I would just love to know, um, you know, details of kind of a formal plan, I'm assuming you have for the next one to two years, and how you will scale the program. Yeah, right now, with the recent change of kind of adopting it and helping a new county implement it, we've developed sort of a franchise model, I would say, but not costly, or not a cost, um, to try to think about how do we support other communities to tailor it to their needs and have both a train-the-trainer model in terms of how you're working with the community champions, 
And also, we are adapting our online platform so that it can work for different counties so that everybody can have access and be able to pull their own data and do their own analysis and understand what impact they're making. Great. And would you um, plan to reach a national level with this program? Would that be the ultimate goal or stay, stay in the state? I think people are coming to us asking about it, so it sort of depends on where that goes. We haven't been promoting it actively, but a lot of counties in California and even other states, we got national recognition with a Michelle Obama Let's Move Award a couple years ago. So a lot of people have just been sort of like, what are you doing in San Francisco? And maybe we could work with you, and what can we take on? So I think San Francisco gets that attention sometimes. We're lucky. We do a lot of investment in early childhood education in a way that other counties can't, or states can't afford. So. So far, we don't have to promote it. People are coming to us. <laughs> um, when you think about the return on investment, um, I would think that um, targeting the most vulnerable communities yeah. that are more likely to um, experience obesity at early ages would be important. So how are you thinking about that in the context of San Francisco and the Bay Area in general, thinking about the East Bay, um, where right. you see more of those um, children in those communities? Yeah. That's who we work with. We are an R&R resource and referral agency, so we're working with Head Start programs and family child care providers and people who are already working with subsidized and low-income kids, and that's our target population. That's who we have relationships with. Um, so I would say almost all the, program, all the programs that we work with are serving low-income families and subsidized kids, and we think about target population that way. Um, thank you. I was, I was wondering about the complexity of, of the work. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is it seems to me if there are simple messages here that have high yield or big results, doing a train-the-trainer model or this dissemination strategy makes sense, the work is really complicated. It seems much harder. And, and I don't have a clear sense of how uh, the core work and, and how complicated it is. Yeah, I think that something that's interesting about we've sort of been a bridge in San Francisco bringing public health and early childhood together. They don't always work together well. I think there's a lot to learn from public health, who's been really evaluating their programs for many years and has really been concentrating on behavior change since the beginning of time. And I feel like early childhood, we're just getting there, sort of, in terms of really making sure that we're making the right impact we want to make. So I think from what we've learned, there are these very clear messages, things that you can do that definitely rise to the top far beyond other things. And if you make these changes, um, it can really impact kids' long-term health. So it's... It's complicated, but probably much less complicated than when you're thinking about interaction with a child where they're learning. You're really kind of changing the environment and changing what they're exposed to. Um, and it is about interaction too, but you're narrowing your focus down to this core group. You're not trying to do everything, I guess. Great, thank you. So uh, joining us next from Colorado, Judy Williams and Michael Taylor, Shared Services for Providers. If it's going to take you more than two minutes to figure something out, just call us instead. That's the mantra we tell child care providers in the Early Learning Ventures Network every day. Hi, my name is Michael, and I have the pleasure of coming to you as the Outreach Supervisor for ELV. And in my day-to-day -day role, I am talking with providers on a near constant basis. And what I'm hearing from them is probably the same message that most of us in this room hear all the time. And that's that early child care providers are feeling overburdened and under-resourced. There's more regulations than ever before, more to do and keep track of, and still only 24 hours in a day. So how can organizations like ours help these child care providers? If it was as easy as my little scale diagram, we should be providing them with more technology resources. Great, excellent. But that's really only the first half of the answer. A 2015 study backed by the Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning found that access to technology, that increasing access to technology resources for ECE professionals did not correspond with an increase in usage of these technology resources. So why is that? The answer is actually pretty simple. They weren't receiving the one-on-one -on -one support necessary to learn the technology resource. You know, they're busy, they were isolated. And that's where ELV comes in. We're a nonprofit shared services hub that manages a child care management system called CORE, which we develop in-house. 
Core helps with all of the back-end services that you need for a child care business. So regulatory compliance, billing, record keeping, attendance tracking, all that fun stuff. But Core is not the sole purpose of what we do, and it's not why we're here. The reason we're here is to give you the same message that we give to providers. That a provider joining the ELV network is getting a partner, not just a product. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., our client, support provider, our client support specialists are working with over 250 providers across Colorado as virtual administrative assistants. Each of our providers receives the individualized support and onboarding necessary to be successful with, their, with our technology resource, and that allows them to focus on their children, not on their paperwork. And they're seeing that difference. Providers in the ELV network, on average, have a quality rating and improvement system score 36% higher than non-ELV sites. As for us, we've been doing quite well the past couple of years. Uh, we now have a retention rate in over 90%, and we have a growth rate of over 15% each of the past three years. Furthermore, in the past two years, we have started four national pilots, but we believe we can go faster. We were made with scaling in mind, and we think we can go faster. You see, in Colorado, we have the benefit of word of mouth. 55% of new customers this year heard about us from a fellow provider. But that's why we're here. We want to spread this wedded delivery of technology and support nationally. And we believe with your help, we can tip the scales back. So now that it's been over two minutes, uh, please follow our mantra and ask us any questions. <laughs> or more accurately, ask my boss questions. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Um, I have a bunch of questions, so I'm trying to figure out like which ones <laughs> um, to ask. Um, but what would you say is your secret sauce um, relative to other child care management platforms? And how do you think about this in the context of scaling as well? Especially when you think about nationally, there are a lot of child care management um, uh, platforms. So. Right. I think our secret sauce is that we're a partner, not just a technology. We're not a technology firm, but we need a technology to have a scalable solution. So ours was built hand in hand with providers, seeing what they needed, addressing where their pain points were, and putting together a solution that works for them so we can get them what they needed, more time, more dollars, so they can focus on building the quality of their program. So again, secret sauce is that we figured out there is technology needed, but you have to work one-on-one -on -one with those providers to make sure they know how to use the technology. It's solving their problem, and it's actually getting them the result of more time, more dollars, so they can focus on the children and build the quality that de they're delivering for children. So, so, so thank you. I'm, I'm wondering um, whether you know how much time you're, at, you're actually saving people, yes. and, and what they're doing with the the free, the released time, now that they have this time, give a sense what they're doing with it. Sure. So we actually had an outside evaluator do a return on investment to the provider on, you know, we, we built this for time and money. We thought that, you know, that's how the solution was built. So in 2017, we had a, an evaluator come in. And what we learned from actual results, working with 19 of the programs that worked with us, these were homes and centers, um, it was $22 per child annually that they were returning with hard direct cost savings, but more importantly, 11 hours per child annually, um, which equated to about $247 if you look at the total, what that equates to in dollars, because that's really a lot of that was the director's time or the family child care provider's time. So we are giving them back time and money. The, the study also showed that they could have gotten four times that amount if they were using every single resource that we were bringing down. So that's where we also looked at how do we engage providers more so that they actually are getting the full benefit. And so um, in terms of what they're doing with that time, that's why we started measuring the quality rating improvement system. And it's uh, mandatory in Colorado, so we wanted to start to see if we were seeing our scores go up, and we were. We also were able to um, engage with other providers um, the federal, the federal government with Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, and we took the shared services and implemented that grant with it, mainly because they have time and dollars now, so they can invest in that really comprehensive service of delivering Early Head Start Child Care Partnership services. 
So one quick question. So how are you working with um, other entities you mentioned, Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships? How are you working with other nonprofit organizations that are also trying to support providers? What does that relationship look like systemically in a state? Sure. So we actually see everybody as a partner. So we definitely, as we built our solution, um, kind of goes back to why are we different? Because we actually brought the people to the table that providers have to deliver the data or, or you know, uh, graded on if they're doing the data correctly. So we brought them to the table because it's not just for providers to get more time and be more accurate and more efficient. We wanted to be able to deliver it more efficiently to the state. So our state partners, we work with the Office of Early Childhood, the QRIS system, the subsidy system, licensing big, big partner early on. As we got early Head Start Child Care Partnerships, we're working statewide in Colorado with 350 of those infant toddler slots and they're within 45 of our partners. And what we did is when we went to implement is we looked at what already exists here in this county and how do we leverage it and make it all work together so it's easy for the provider to understand it so that they're able to get the supports and services they need and can deliver that high quality early head start services. So yes, we don't want to, just like we keep telling providers, don't keep recreating the wheel. Why does everybody have to recreate their own policies, procedures, et cetera? We also work with our nonprofit partners, our coaches and everybody else. We shouldn't have to recreate. We should take it in, take what's there and all work together to make it more efficient, make it stronger and make it work for providers. Great, thank, thank you. you. Please welcome uh, We Care for Dane Kids, Wisconsin, Ruth Schmidt and Katherine Magnuson. Hi, I'm Ruth and I'm here with my colleague Katherine on behalf of the We Care for Dane Kids team. An unprecedented collaborative between a top tier research university, the largest privately held third party benefit administrator in the nation, the city of Madison, Wisconsin and nonprofits with decades of experience. Like many communities across our country, the early childhood system in Dane County is failing. Assuming parents can even find childcare, the cost exceeds that of housing, healthcare, and transportation, leaving thousands of families priced out of the market. And although it's the extreme cost of care that we see most easily, the problem runs much deeper. Childcare programs operate on razor thin margins, Early childhood providers earn poverty level wages and the turnover rate is pushing 40%. In Dane County alone in the last decade, we lost over half of our regulated programs. The consequences are felt well the beyond. Con yes, thank you. The consequences are felt well beyond the early childhood sector. Parents are working less, they have less income to support their families, employers struggle to hire and retain talent, increasingly women. There's no silver bullet to fix this solution. Your light is out. Oh, That's you. fine. There's no silver bullet to fix this solution. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Solutions must match the scale of the problem. We have devised a four-part solution, sorry, four fingers, um, that will make, take advantage of every available resource, public and private, to address both the supply and the demand side of this problem. One. We will partner with business to put more money into the pockets of working parents to pay for care by making employer contributions into and increasing the use of dependent care flexible spending accounts. Also, at a time when working parents can't afford to put money into their retirement account, we will seek an IRS letter ruling that will allow an employer to make a retirement match based upon an employee's child care expenses. Two, Child care programs are small businesses struggling to survive. We will connect group and family programs in a shared services network, a virtual back office to provide administrative supports like bulk purchasing, payroll, billing, and shared staffing. Three, 90% of eligible families in Wisconsin are not using our child care subsidy program. We will build on a model of community-based navigators to support families in learning about and applying for this important benefit. And finally, we will seek strategies and policy and public revenue changes at the state and local level to ensure that more money is coming into this important sector so that childcare programs can pay their employees more, thus reducing turnover. This will allow us to develop a quality system of care and education for our young children. Invest in We Care, because you care too.
Thank you. So um, a question about two of your prongs. One is regarding the um, policy and advocacy campaign, and then I amplifying the need um, for folks to sort of know that they have the ability to access subsidy, for example. Mm -hmm. So can you describe a little bit more about how, given nationally, we're really struggling with um, ensuring that families understand um, the um, program's um, access uh, what are you doing in terms of the marketing and the campaigning um, as it relates to public policy and advocacy? Um, so two separate things. So the first thing is um, in Dane County, um, one of our partners is the Head Start uh, program there, the grantee. Um, and they, like many other programs, realized that they were really suffering because families were having problems getting and maintaining their child care subsidy payments. So they went to the county and they said, look, let us have one of your workers, one of the people that determines eligibility and then uh, certifies everything, work with us in our programs so that we are bringing those services and benefits to the families themselves rather than making them call in, call in again, call in a fifth time and then show up on the bus to bring the paperwork that's necessary. So we have an actual outreach project where people will be going into communities talking to parents directly. Low-income families aren't on easily found social media platforms. It's not about targeting them with mailings. It's about getting to the places where they are, the events, the communities, and telling them what they can make happen, and then making sure they get those benefits. So it's, it's both parts of those. Um, do you want to say something well, about would, advocacy? Sure. So in the advocacy thing, I think what I would say um, is that we're funded through a variety of um, national sources uh, that allow us to both do lobbying um, and to do significant policy outreach work in a multi-sector way. So we're really looking at doing multi-sector um, advocacy with um, counties association, municipalities, with our hospitals, with our health care clinics, with our churches. Um, we've partnered with all of them in forming um, a state collaborative team that then will allow us to use their avenues also in terms of doing advocacy. Because um, not surprisingly, um, it is the people that work well outside of the world of childcare that are really knocking on the door saying, what can we do to fix this? This is a huge problem. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the comprehensive approach you're taking to this, because um, it is that big of a problem. Um, of the four strands, do you find um, one or two are the most critical in having this work? And what kind of progress have you seen in those areas? I think partly the answer is going to depend on what you think is the most important outcome, right? So if, you, if you're interested in making sure that low-income children have access to high-quality child care, then you're going to focus on something like the child care subsidy outreach because that's going to solve that problem. If you're interested in making sure that there's actually child care for even middle-class parents, you know, we all know it's like $16,000, $17,000 a year, then you're going to be interested in shared services and those dependent care spending accounts. Um, and I think if you care about the workforce and their ability to deliver quality programs, then you have to care about wages because they now make more, you can make more as a dog walker in Madison, Wisconsin, or in Whole Foods than you will in a child care center. I mean, we know this. So that's why we came to the problem not thinking, what can we get money to do, but what needs to happen in this community for this system to be sustainable and for our kids to get high quality care. And so we came at it with multiple partners who had been doing lots of different things in different places mm -hmm. and really brought this, this collaborative and comprehensive vision to think about systems change as opposed to just trying to put a Band-Aid on one part of the system. So can I take that to mean you, you ask kids what you care about, what do you care about? <laughs> Well, so I'm representing the team, <laughs> so you have to be careful. But I can tell you, I mean, we have like we have conversation as a team. I really care about access for low-income children. Um, that's something that's really important to me. I care deeply. Ruth cares a lot about our workforce. Um, we have other people that will that care a lot about the programs closing down. And literally, like our our business partners, task. Their problem is, is that in, in Wisconsin, they, we can't get workers, right? Like we literally have a worker, a worker shortage, and people will say, we can't find child care. You cannot hire someone because we have no child care to offer them in our communities. And I, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the only thing I might add to that is just that when we started doing this work over a year ago now, a year and a half ago probably, like it, it literally is 
that we have to advance all four parts at the same time. We yeah. can't do one at a time. Right. We wanted to get millions of dollars to do a wage supplement. Guess what? We didn't get it. So we have to attack it from policy, right? So we're moving all four strands together. Right. And, and we know, like, if you want to increase quality, you're going to, if you do it without increased resources, you're going to price people out of the market. If you want to bring in low-income kids into care, but you're not increasing capacity, then you're going to price other people out of the market. So it's this recognition that it really is the system, and you're kidding yourself if you can really put, you know, a, a Band-Aid on one piece one and piece. not tackle the whole thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenters, Micah Knox and Katerina Sergi, connected for success from Mississippi. Welcome. Good afternoon, friends. My name is Katerina Sergi, and along with uh, Dr. Micah Knox, we are representing Mississippi, where we are connected for success. We want to tell you our story, a story that has been in works for the last five years. Our aspiration is to bring Mississippi in the forefront for positive system change. Five years ago, the state of Mississippi engaged in a rigorous needs assessment with qualitative and quantitative components. We learn a lot of things through the needs assessment. We learn that our workforce uh, educators uh, early learning educators uh, have difficulty in building their qualifications. We learned that the quality and improvement rating system that we used up to this point stratified providers instead of uh, uh, building their qualifications uh, for higher quality. We also faced with the fact that uh, we didn't have a universal pre-K infrastructure that produced uh, measurable outcomes for children. We also learned that we had abundance of early learning programs, but they operated in silos, and that made the coordination really difficult to support children, families, and providers in the community. But all these changed in 2016, where the state introduced a new strategic plan. So following our statewide needs assessment, the development of our Mississippi strategic plan began. And it was a very exciting time because the primary goal for our information gathering process was to highlight a voice that for so long in our state was not heard. And that was the voice of our child care providers and the voices of our families. And for us to really kind of flip our approach from being top down to building those up who are in the fields, um, building those up and really making our work be provider driven. So the development of our strategic plan, strategic plan brought to fruition the family-based unified and integrated early childhood system, along with the rollout of our standard and comprehensive center quality designations. So another um, important development was the establishment of our early childhood academies. And the primary role of those early childhood academies is to be a, pro a support mechanism for child care providers and families in our state. So we wanted to make sure that we leveraged the resources we had available in our state we were successful um, in being awarded the um, preschool development grant. Our primary goal for that grant was to make sure that we broke down those silos and created a network of child care centers across our state's mixed delivery system that included private child care, home family, our early learning collaboratives, Head Start, and local education agencies based on those two designations. Standard being um, a focus on high quality service in terms of a curriculum, health and safety, and staff and training, and comprehensive building on that um, standard designation and focus on continuing of care. And also making sure that we infuse coaching and technical assistance into our child care systems. So in sum, it's really about making sure that we stay on an upward trajectory to improve the quality of care um, that providers provide and that families receive and go beyond checking boxes in our state and make sure that we implement a continuum of care for children and our families. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, would just like to ask a question about um, the, system, the systemic piece of trying to bring everything in together under a strategic plan. And what do you think is the greatest challenge that you're facing in terms of bringing all of that together? Um, I would say one of the biggest challenges is you're introducing something new into the state. 
But I think we were really successful with looking at our program scan, seeing what we had available in the state, the work that other entities were doing, and how we could all come together and leverage those resources and making sure that our child care providers understood that through this new implementation, you're not alone in it. You have a support system that's here to support you through resources, through our coaching, and through our technical assistance. So just making sure that providers knew and families knew that resources were available um, has been a huge plus for us in the state. Also another aspect, another challenge that we faced was to bring everybody, all stakeholders at the same table. So this is a big uh, success that we have over the last two years where we have Head Start, uh, tribal organizations, uh, Department of Education, Human Services, Health, Mental Health, uh, parents and providers coming into the same table and really participating in the discussions about the framing of a new system for early childhood care. Awesome, thank you. Um, I like the approach of not being top down, that you're intentional about the providers and the families. So I have two questions. Um, what are families saying about this and how are they helping with the implementation process? And um, what has surprised you in the first year of getting this off the ground? So one thing um, that we're hearing from families, um, and we're still kind of marketing a lot of the work that we do with our early childhood academies, um, which is our resource and referral um, network, they are always say, we didn't know this was available. So we're really working on using social media and word of mouth and going to places that we know that families frequent. Um, we're using our museums, churches, um, the libraries, grocery stores, and we're leaving information there so families are aware that these services are actually available for them. We have identified in our state that we have a huge homeschool population that utilize our academy resources. They bring their children there in those spaces to learn, to interact with the resources. Um, so our families, when they hear about it, they're very excited. And also adding to that, I would like to say that we have try to create outlets for uh, families to share their voice. Uh, we have a consumer education site uh, through uh, the State Early Childhood uh, Advisory Council. Uh, we have uh, onboard meetings for providers and families to participate. So we try to really reach out to, to, to the big population. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. So please join me in welcoming our final presenters of the day. They've waited a long time to take the stage uh, from California. Uh, Fast Talk, Vidya Sundaram and Elizabeth O'Brien. Thank you. Good evening now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so just to start off, we want you to meet Ariel. She is a five-year-old. She lives in Oakland, California with her mom, Maria. And Maria wants to help Ariel succeed at school. And she's looking for guidance from Ariel's teacher to learn what Ariel's learning in school, how she can support that learning at home. But she's worried about the communication and language barrier that exists between them. Ariel is just beginning her educational journey. And as an English learner, she faces a number of academic risk factors. English learners represent nearly 10% of the school age population, but compared to their non-EL peers, they're not meeting reading proficiency standards at the same rates. They're also more likely to experience uh, higher rates of unemployment, and there are also social and economic consequences that result from these different disparities. So how do we help parents and teachers collaborate to support these students? Well, through FAST Talk, which stands for Families and Schools Talk. Through Fast Talk, families receive curriculum aligned activities by text message in their home language that they can do to support their child's social, emotional, and academic success. Fast Talk messages are activities that parents can do anywhere, anytime. So if you're busy, it's no problem. Also, Fast Talk is there from the moment children enter school to help support parent teacher collaboration because the messages come from the child's teacher and also prompt ongoing communication between parents and teachers throughout the year about learning. Finally, to make it feasible for teachers, we pre-schedule and preload those messages. We know that when parents support learning at home, that's when students like Ariel are more likely to succeed. And those language barriers, that lack of time that Vidya mentioned, those are the ways that can, can, uh, can inhibit that parent-teacher partnership that's so important. And we know that EL parents in particular are less likely to receive communication from their child's teacher about ways to support learning at home, even though they're just as likely to want their children to succeed academically. So is Fast Talk having an impact? Yes, it is. 
not only do teachers report that they save more time and also are overcoming those communication barriers, but 80% of Spanish-speaking parents report that they learn new ways to support their child's learning. And also four times more kindergarten students using Fast Talk met literacy benchmarks at the end of the year compared to non-Fast Talk students. We're having the most profound impact with students whose parents don't share a common language with their teacher. So how do we support more children like Ariel? By strengthening those relationships between parents and teachers and making use of widely used technology like text messaging, we're not only helping English learners like Ariel succeed, we're helping rural families with limited internet connectivity, students with disabilities, as well as families who are living in poverty. Fast Talk is engaging 14,000 families in California, Arizona, and Louisiana, but many more families need our services to be able to promote equitable educational outcomes and help close the opportunity gap. And Investing in Fast Talk will help us provide an impactful and scalable, affordable solution to more high needs families. So help us achieve our vision where parents like Maria can collaborate with teachers to ensure that vulnerable students like Ariel thrive starting in early childhood and continuing throughout their educational journey. Thank you. That was fast. Nice job. Um, <laughs> How much time is a parent or guardian expected to engage in the texting before those outcomes are realized for their children? We've done some studies that started around 15 weeks and we start to see those outcomes and we've also had the opportunity to do some qualitative research earlier on and so we'll talk to families about what they're doing with their kids. They'll also mention that it's fun so it's something that's reinforcing for them which is really important for us. So we've started to see those student outcomes start to emerge and also from teacher and parent report earlier on and then after a year we're seeing some of these powerful student outcomes. We're doing propensity score matching, more quasi-experimental approaches to see those larger impacts. Great. One, one other question is, this is voluntary, right? How, how many families have volunteered for this? Yeah. Sure, I can share more about that. So when we uh, work with school, we work with school districts and then at school and then uh, classroom level. And so to give you an example in Oakland Unified, where we are currently in 36 schools there, um, we have about 85% of families are participating um, in the classrooms there. Just answer part of my question. Um, how are you thinking about scaling um, both across um, schools, districts, states, your multiple states? So how are you thinking about that? Um, yeah. Sure. Um, so scaling is, um, is a really uh, challenging thing. Um, and what we do is we really we work with partners to help us introduce us to school systems. And so I can highlight a few partnerships that are in place right now that are helping us do that. One is with the Louisiana Department of Education. As a publisher of a curriculum, um, the guidebooks, ELA curriculum, we've worked with them to create resources that are specifically reinforcing the lessons in the guidebooks curriculum. And through that partnership with LDOE, we're being able to get the word out to school systems across the state. We started last year in six school system systems. This year we're uh, in 18 and growing. So through that, that type of partnership and outreach um, that's being facilitated at a state level is helping us do that type of outreach. We're also exploring similar partnerships, not um, with, the, with governmental entities that are doing um, curriculum development, but um, publishers that are doing curriculum development as well to see if that model can, expand, um, can extend to different types of partnerships. Thank you. <laughs> um, now I'm trying to remember what I was going to ask you. So, uh, it was a, I know it was a question was about, it, it's about feedback loops. So are you getting data from families about their use of your text messages and are you able, I mean, is this part of a continuous improvement process? Yeah. So one feature, too, of our tool is that on Fridays we'll send a poll out to parents. So we'll ask them, did you try the activity this week? Reply one if yes, two if not yet. And so that's one way that we're just tracking sort of engagement with the tool. We also couple that with more qualitative interviews and focus groups to understand more what's happening in, in, in the classroom and at home. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. So can we have a round of applause for the scaling track? So
So, one more chance for you to vote. Um, at the Poll Everywhere site, uh, for this round, again, since the focus is on scaling, uh, keep in mind the innovation, the foundation from which the scaling is taking place, some of the early results and traction. Keep that all in mind as you are voting. We will reconvene at about 6.30 when we will announce the winners of the scaling track. So, thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. So before I announce the winners for the scaling track, I want to just thank everybody for being here with us this afternoon. This is really a privilege for us to host this event. We are so just thrilled at um, learning about all of your ideas. So let's give one more big round of applause to all our panelists. I want to thank uh, Noni and Stephanie for making this part of the Zance Initiative. I think this is really, I can't tell you what a highlight of the year this is for all of us, so thank you so much. A big thank you to our judges who managed to get all their questions in in three minutes at a time, um, which required a lot of pre-work and a lot of coordination. You all were terrific, so thank you so much. And I want to thank one more time Emily, Megan, and Lizzie for making the whole afternoon go on time. Um, you all did a great job, so thank you. Um, you know, the innovative and collaborative solutions you saw today give us a lot of reasons for optimism for the future. That's one of the reasons why this challenge is important to us. So we'll look forward to following all of your good work. Um, and to seeing all the great things you'll do. Thank you for your dedication to young children. Um, now I get to announce the winners for the scaling track. And after I do this, I'm going to ask all the winners just to come up on stage so we can take some pictures. Um, third place, Connected for Success. Second place, Shared Services for Providers. And first place, Fast Talk. Thanks again to all of you for a great evening. We'll look forward to seeing you next year.